Chapter 10, My First Supper This examination over, we heard someone yell, Go out into the hall! One of the patients kindly explained that this was an invitation to supper. We latecomers tried to keep together, so we entered the hall and stood at the door where all the women had crowded. How we shivered as we stood there! The windows were open, and the draft went whizzing through the hall. The patients looked blue with cold, and the minutes stretched into a quarter of an hour. At last one of the nurses went forward and unlocked a door, through which we were all crowded to a landing of the stairway. Here again came a long halt directly before an open window. "'How very imprudent for the attendants to keep these thinly clad women standing here in the cold,' said Miss Neville. I looked at the poor crazy captives shivering, and added emphatically, "'It's horribly brutal!' While they stood there, I thought I would not relish supper that night. They looked so lost and hopeless. Some were chattering nonsense to invisible persons. Others were laughing or crying aimlessly. And one old, gray-haired woman was nudging me, and with winks and sage noddings of the head and pitiful uplifting of the eyes and hands, was assuring me that I must not mind the poor creatures, as they were all mad. "'Stop at the heater,' was then ordered, "'and get in line, two by two. Mary, get a companion. How many times must I tell you to keep in line? Stand still. And as the orders were issued, a shove and a push were administered, and often a slap on the ears. After this third and final halt, we were marched into a long, narrow dining room, where a rush was made for the table. The table reached the length of the room, and was uncovered and uninviting. Long benches without backs were put for the patients to sit on, and over these they had to crawl in order to face the table. Placed close together all along the table were large dressing bowls filled with a pinkish-looking stuff, which the patients called tea. By each bowl was laid a piece of bread, cut thick and buttered. A small saucer containing five prunes accompanied this bread. One fat woman made a rush, and jerking up several saucers from those around her, emptied their contents into her own saucer. Then, while holding to her own bowl, she lifted up another and drained its contents at one gulp. This she did to a second bowl in shorter time than it takes to tell it. Indeed, I was so amused at her successful grabbings, that when I looked at my own chair, the woman opposite, without so much as a by your leave, grabbed my bread and left me without any. Another patient, seeing this, kindly offered me hers, but I declined with thanks and turned to the nurse and asked for more. As she flung a thick piece down on the table, she made some remark about the fact that if I forgot where my home was, I had not forgotten how to eat. I tried the bread, but the butter was so horrible that one could not eat it. A blue-eyed German girl on the opposite side of the table told me I could have bread unbuttered if I wished, and that very few were able to eat the butter. I turned my attention to the prunes, and found that very few of them would be sufficient. A patient near asked me to give them to her. I did so. My bowl of tea was all that was left. I tasted it, and one taste was enough. It had no sugar, and it tasted as if it had been made in copper. It was as weak as water. This was also transferred to a hungrier patient, in spite of the protest of Miss Neville. "'You must force the food down,' she said, "'else you will be sick. And who know but what, with these surroundings, you may go crazy. To have a good brain, the stomach must be cared for.' "'It is impossible for me to eat that stuff,' I replied. "'And despite all her urging, I ate nothing that night. "'It did not require much time for the patients to consume all that was eatable on the table, "'and then we got our orders to form in line in the hall. "'When this was done, the doors before us were unlocked, "'and we were ordered to proceed back to the sitting-room. "'Many of the patients crowded near us, and I was again urged to play, "'both by them and by the nurses.' To please the patients, I promised to play, and Miss Tilly Mayard was to sing. The first thing she asked me to play was Rockabye Baby, and I did so. She sang it beautifully. End of chapter 10 Recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ten Days in a Madhouse by Nellie Bly Chapter 11 In the Bath 
A few more songs, and we were told to go with Miss Group. We were taken into a cold, wet bathroom, and I was ordered to undress. Did I protest? Well, I never grew so earnest in my life as when I tried to beg off. They said if I did not, they would use force, and that it would not be very gentle. At this, I noticed one of the craziest women in the ward, standing by the filled bathtub, with a large, discolored rag in her hands. She was chattering away to herself, and chuckling in a manner which seemed to me fiendish. I knew now what was to be done with me. I shivered. They began to undress me, and one by one they pulled off my clothes. At last, everything was gone excepting one garment. I will not remove it, I said vehemently, but they took it off. I gave one glance at the group of patients gathered at the door watching the scene, and I jumped into the bathtub with more energy than grace. The water was ice cold, and I again began to protest. How useless it all was! I begged, at least that the patients be made to go away, but was ordered to shut up. The crazy woman began to scrub me. I can find no other word that will express it but scrubbing. From a small tin pan she took some soft soap, and rubbed it all over me, even all over my face and my pretty hair. I was at last past seeing or speaking, although I had begged that my hair be left untouched. Rub, 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 went the old woman, chattering to herself. My teeth chattered, and my limbs were goose-fleshed and blue with cold. Suddenly I got, one after the other, three buckets of water over my head, ice-cold water, too, into my eyes, my ears, my nose, and my mouth. I think I experienced some of the sensations of a drowning person as they dragged me, gasping, shivering, and quaking from the tub. For once I did look insane. I caught a glance of the indescribable look on the faces of my companions, who had witnessed my fate and knew theirs was surely following. Unable to control myself at the absurd picture I presented, I burst into roars of laughter. They put me, dripping wet, into a short Canton flannel slip, labeled across the extreme end in large black letters, Lunatic Asylum, B-I-H-6. The letters meant Blackwell's Island, Hall 6. By this time, Miss Mayard had been undressed, and much as I hated my recent bath, I would have taken another, if by it I could have saved her the experience. Imagine plunging that sick girl into a cold bath when it made me, who had never been ill, shake as if with Og. I heard her explain to Miss Group that her head was still sore from her illness. Her hair was short and had mostly come out, and she asked that the crazy woman be made to rub more gently. But Miss Group said, "'There isn't much fear of hurting you. Shut up, or you'll get it worse.' Miss Mayer did shut up, and that was my last look at her for the night. I was hurried into a room where there were six beds, and be had been put into bed when someone came along and jerked me out again, saying, "'Nellie Brown has to be put in a room alone tonight, for I suppose she's noisy.' I was taken to room 28, and left to try and make an impression on the bed. It was an impossible task. The bed had been made high in the center, and sloping on either side. At the first touch my head flooded the pillow with water, and my wet slip transferred some of its dampness to the sheet. When Miss Group came in, I asked if I could not have a nightgown. "'We do not have such things in this institution,' she said. "'I do not like to sleep without it,' I replied. "'Well, I don't care about that,' she said. "'You are in a public institution now, and you can't expect to get anything. "'This is charity, and you should be thankful for what you get.' "'But the city pays to keep these places up.' I urged, and pays people to be kind to the unfortunates brought here. Well, you don't need to expect any kindness here, for you won't get it, she said, and she went out and closed the door. A sheet and an oilcloth were under me, and a sheet and black wool blanket above. I never felt anything so annoying as that wool blanket, as I tried to keep it around my shoulders to stop the chills from getting underneath. When I pulled it up, I left my feet bare and when I pulled it down, my shoulders were exposed. There was absolutely nothing in the room but the bed and myself. As the door had been locked, I imagined I should be left alone for the night, but I heard the sound of the heavy tread of two women down the hall. They stopped at every door, unlocked it, and in a few minutes I could hear them relock it. 
This they did without the least attempt at quietness, down the whole length of the opposite side of the hall, and up to my room. Here they paused. The key was inserted in the lock and turned. I watched those about to enter. In they came, dressed in brown and white striped dresses, fastened by brass buttons, large white aprons, a heavy green cord about the waist, from which dangled a bunch of key large keys, and small white caps on their heads. Being dressed as were the attendants of the day, I knew they were nurses. The first one carried a lantern, and she flashed its light into my face while she said to her assistant, "'This is Nellie Brown.' Looking at her, I asked, "'Who are you?' "'The night nurse, my dear,' she replied. And wishing that I would sleep well, she went out and locked the door after her. Several times during the night they came into my room, and even had I been able to sleep, the unlocking of the heavy door— their loud talking and heavy tread would have awakened me. I could not sleep, so I lay in bed, picturing to myself the horrors in case a fire should break out in the asylum. Every door is locked separately, and the windows are heavily barred, so that escape is impossible. In the one building alone there are, I think Dr. Ingram told me, some three hundred women. They are locked, one to ten to a room. It is impossible to get out unless these doors are unlocked. A fire is not improbable, but one of the most likely occurrences. Should the building burn, the jailers or nurses would never think of releasing their crazy patients. This I can prove to you later, when I come to tell of their cruel treatment of the poor things entrusted to their care. As I say, in case of fire, not a dozen women could escape. All would be left to roast to death. Even if the nurses were kind— which they are not, it would require more presence of mind than women of their class possess to risk the flames in their own lives while they unlocked the hundred doors for the insane prisoners. Unless there is a change, there will some day be a tale of horror never equaled. In this connection is an amusing incident, which happened just previous to my release. I was talking to Dr. Ingram about many things, and at last told him what I thought would be the result of a fire. "'The nurses are expected to open the doors,' he said. "'But you know positively that they would not wait to do that,' I said. "'And these women would burn to death.' "'He sat silent, unable to contradict my assertion. "'Why don't you have it changed?' I asked. "'What can I do?' he replied. "'I offer suggestions until my brain is tired. "'But what good does it do? "'What would you do?' he asked, "'turning to me, the proclaimed insane girl.' Well, I should insist on them having locks put in, as I have seen in some places, that by turning a crank at the end of the hall you can lock or unlock every door on the one side. Then there would be some chance of escape. Now, every door being locked separately, there is absolutely none. Dr. Ingram turned to me with an anxious look on his kind face, as he asked slowly, Nellie Brown, what institution have you been an inmate of before you came here? None. I was never confined in any institution, except boarding school, in my life. Where, then, did you see the locks you have described? I had seen them in the new Western Penitentiary at Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but I did not dare say so. I merely answered, Oh, I I've seen them in a place I was in, I, I mean as a visitor. There is only one place I know of where they have those locks, he said sadly, and that is at Sing Sing. The inference is conclusive. I laughed very heartily over the implied accusation, and tried to assure him that I had never, up to date, been an inmate of Sing Sing, or even ever visited it. Just as the morning began to dawn, I went to sleep. It did not seem many moments until I was rudely awakened, and told to get up, the window being opened and the clothing pulled off me. My hair was still wet, and I had pains all through me, as if I had the rheumatism. Some clothing was flung on the floor, and I was told to put it on. I asked for my own, but was told to take what I got and keep quiet, by the apparently head nurse, Miss Grady. I looked at it. One underskirt made of coarse dark cotton goods, and a cheap white calico dress with a black spot in it. I tied the strings of the skirt around me and put on the little dress. It was made, as are all those worn by the patients, into a straight, tight waist, sewed on to a straight skirt. As I buttoned the waist, I noticed the underskirt was about six inches longer than the upper, 
and for a moment I sat down on the bed and laughed at my own appearance. No woman ever longed for a mirror more than I did at that moment. I saw the other patients hurrying past in the hall, so I decided not to lose anything that might be going on. We numbered forty-five patients in Hall 6, and were sent to the bathroom, where there were two coarse towels. I watched crazy patients, who had the most dangerous eruptions all over their faces dry on the towels, and then saw women with clean skins turn to use them. I went to the bathtub and washed my face at the running faucet, and my underskirt did duty for a towel. Before I had completed my ablutions, a bench was brought into the bathroom. Miss Group and Miss McCartan came in with combs in their hands. We were told so to sit down on the bench, and the hair of forty-five women was combed with one patient, two nurses, and six combs. As I saw some of the sore heads combed, I thought this was another dose I had not bargained for. Miss Tilly Mayard had her own comb, but it was taken from her by Miss Grady. Oh, that combing! I never realized before what the expression, I'll give you a combing, meant, but I knew then. My hair, all matted and wet from the night previous, was pulled and jerked, and after expostulating to no avail, I set my teeth and endured the pain. They refused to give me my hairpins, and my hair was arranged in one plait and tied with a red cotton rag. My curly bangs refused to stay back, so that at least was left of my former glory. After this we went to the sitting-room, and I looked for my companions. At first I looked vainly, unable to distinguish them from the other patients, but after a while I recognized Miss Mayard by her short hair. "'How did you sleep after your cold bath?' "'I almost froze, and then the noise kept me awake. It's dreadful! My nerves were so unstrung before I came here, and I fear I shall not be able to stand the strain.' I did the best I could to cheer her. I asked that we be given additional clothing, at least as much as custom says women shall wear, but they told me to shut up, that we had as much as they intended to give us. Recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ten Days in a Madhouse by Nellie Bly Chapter 13 Choking and Beating Patients Miss Tilly Mayard suffered greatly from the cold. One morning she sat on the bench next to me and was livid with the cold. Her limbs shook and her teeth chattered. I spoke to the three attendants who sat with coats on at the table in the center of the floor. "'It is cruel to lock people up and then freeze them,' I said. "'They replied she had on as many as any of the rest, and she would get no more. "'Just then Miss Mayard took a fit, and every patient looked frightened. "'Miss Neville caught her in her arms and held her, although the nurses roughly said, "'Let her fall on the floor. It will teach her a lesson.' "'Miss Neville told them what she thought of their actions, "'and then I got orders to make my appearance in the office.' Just as I reached there, Superintendent Dent came to the door, and I told him how we were suffering from the cold, and of Miss Mayard's condition. Doubtless I spoke incoherently, for I told of the state of the food, the treatment of the nurses, and their refusal to give more clothing, the condition of Miss Mayard, and the nurses telling us, because the asylum was a public institution, we could not expect even kindness. Assuring him that I needed no medical aid, I told him to go to Miss Mayard. He did so. From Miss Neville and other patients, I learned what transpired. Miss Mayard was still in the fit, and he caught her roughly between the eyebrows or thereabouts, and pinched until her face was crimson from the rush of blood to the head, and her senses returned. All day afterward she suffered from terrible headaches, and from that on she grew worse. Insane? Yes, insane. And as I watched the insanity slowly creep over the mind that had appeared to be all right, I secretly cursed the doctors, the nurses, and all public institutions. Some one may say that she was insane at some time previous to her consignment to the asylum. Then, if she were, was this the proper place to send a woman just convalescing, to be given cold baths, deprived of sufficient clothing, and fed with horrible food? On this morning I had a long conversation with Dr. Ingram, the assistant superintendent of the asylum. I found that he was kind to the helpless in his charge. 
I began my old complaint of the cold, and he called Miss Grady to the office and ordered more clothing given the patients. Miss Grady said if I made a practice of telling, it would be a serious thing for me, she warned, in time. People in the world can never imagine the length of days to those in asylums. They seem never-ending, and we welcomed any event that might give us something to think about, as well as talk of. There is nothing to read, and the only bit of talk that never wears out is conjuring up delicate food that they will get as soon as they get out. Anxiously the hour was watched for when the boat arrived, to see if there were any new unfortunates to be added to our ranks. When they came and were ushered into the sitting-room, the patients would express sympathy to one another for them, and were anxious to show them little marks of attention. Hall six was the receiving hall, so that was how we saw all newcomers. Soon after my advent, a girl called Eurena Littlepage was brought in. She was, as she had been born, silly, and her tender spot was, as with many sensible women, her age. She claimed eighteen, and would grow very angry if told to the contrary. The nurses were not long in finding this out, and then they teased her. Eurena, said Miss Grady, the doctors say that you are thirty-three instead of eighteen. And the other nurses laughed. They kept up this until the simple creature began to yell and cry, saying she wanted to go home, and that everybody treated her badly. After they had gotten all the amusement out of her they wanted, and she was crying, they began to scold and tell her to keep quiet. She grew more hysterical every moment, until they pounced upon her and slapped her face and knocked her head in a lively fashion. This made the poor creature cry the more, and so they choked her. Yes, actually choked her. Then they dragged her out to the closet, and I heard her terrified cries hush into smothered ones. After several hours' absence, she returned to the sitting-room, and I plainly saw the marks of their fingers on her throat for the entire day. This punishment seemed to awaken their desire to administer more. They returned to the sitting-room and caught hold of an old gray-haired woman, whom I had heard addressed both as Mrs. Grady and Mrs. O'Keefe. She was insane, and she talked almost continually to herself and to those near her. She never spoke very loud, and at the time I speak of was sitting harmlessly chattering to herself. They grabbed her, and my heart ached as she cried, For God's sakes, ladies, please don't let them beat me. Shut up, you hussy, said Miss Grady, as she caught the woman by her gray hair and dragged her shrieking and pleading from the room. She was also taken to the closet, and her cries grew lower and lower, and then ceased. The nurses returned to the room, and Miss Grady remarked that she had settled the old fool for a while. I told some of the physicians of the occurrence, but they did not pay any attention to it. One of the characters in Hall 6 was Matilda, a little old German woman, who, I believe, went insane over the loss of money. She was small and had a pretty pink complexion. She was not much trouble, except at times. She would take spells when she would talk into the seam heaters or get up on a chair and talk out of the windows. In these conversations, she railed at the lawyers who had taken her property. The nurses seemed to find a great deal of amusement in teasing the harmless old soul. One day I sat beside Miss Grady and Miss Group and heard them tell her perfectly vile things to call Miss McCartan. After telling her to say these things, they would send her to the other nurse. But Matilda proved that she, even in her state, had more sense than they. I cannot tell you it is private, was all she would say. I saw Miss Grady, on a pretense of whispering to her, spit in her ear. Matilda quietly wiped her ear and said nothing. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 Some Unfortunate Stories By this time I had made the acquaintance of the greater number of the forty-five women in Hall 6. Let me introduce a few. Louise, the pretty German girl who I have spoken of formerly as being sick with fever, had the delusion that the spirits of her dead parents were with her. "'I have gotten many beatings from Miss Grady and her assistants,' she said, "'and I am unable to eat the horrible food they give us. "'I ought not to be compelled to freeze for want of proper clothing. "'Oh, I pray nightly that I may be taken to my papa and mamma. "'One night, when I was confined at Bellevue, Dr. Field came. "'I was in bed and weary of the examination. "'At last I said, I am tired of this, I will talk no more.' 
Won't you? he said angrily. I'll see if I can't make you. With this, he laid his crutch on the side of the bed, and getting up on it, he pinched me very severely in the ribs. I jumped up straight in bed and said, What do you mean by this? I want to teach you to obey when I speak to you, he replied. If I could only die and go to Papa. When I left, she was confined to bed with a fever, and maybe by this time she has her wish. There was a French woman confined in Hall Six, or was during my stay, whom I firmly believed to be perfectly sane. I watched her and talked with her every day, excepting the last three, and I was unable to find any delusion or mania in her. Her name is Josephine Dupre, if that is spelled correctly, and her husband and all her friends are in France. Josephine feels her position keenly. Her lips tremble, and she breaks down crying when she talks of her helpless condition. How did you get here? I asked. One morning, as I was trying to get breakfast, I grew deathly sick, and two officers were called in by the woman of the house, and I was taken to the station house. I was unable to understand their proceedings, and they paid little attention to my story. Doings in this country were new to me. And before I realized it, I was lodged as an insane woman in this asylum. When I first came, I cried that I was here without hope of release, and for crying, Miss Grady and her assistants choked me until they hurt my throat, for it has been sore ever since. I had been watching and talking with a fair complexioned woman for several days, and I was at a loss to see why she had been sent there. She was so sane. Why did you come here? I asked her one day, after we had indulged in a long conversation. I was sick, she replied. Are you sick mentally? I urged. Oh, no! What gave you such an idea? I had been overworking myself, and I broke down. Having some family trouble and being penniless and nowhere to go, I applied to the commissioners to be sent to the poorhouse until I would be able to work. But they do not send poor people here unless they are insane. I said, Don't you know there are only insane women, or those supposed to be, sent here? I knew after I got here that the majority of these women were insane, but then I believed them when they told me this was the place they sent all the poor who applied for aid as I had done. How have you been treated? I asked. Well, so far I have escaped a beating, although I have been sickened at the sight of many and the recital of more. When I was brought here, they gave me a bath, and the very disease for which I needed doctoring, and from which I was suffering, made it necessary that I should not bathe. But they put me in, and my sufferings were increased greatly for weeks thereafter. A Mrs. McCartney, whose husband is a tailor, seems perfectly rational, and has not one fancy. Mary Hughes and Mrs. Louise Shantz showed no obvious traces of insanity. One day, two newcomers were added to our list. The one was an idiot, Carrie Glass, and the other was a nice looking German girl. Quite young she seemed, and when she came in, all the patients spoke of her nice appearance and apparent sanity. Her name was Margaret. She told me she had been a cook, and was extremely neat. One day, after she had scrubbed the kitchen floor, the chambermaids came down and deliberately soiled it. Her temper was aroused, and she began to quarrel with them. An officer was called, and she was taken to an asylum. How can they say I am insane merely because I allowed my temper to run away with me? she complained. Other people are not shut up for crazy when they get angry. I suppose the only thing to do is keep quiet and so avoid the beatings which I see others get. No one can say one word about me. I do everything I am told and all the work they give me. I am obedient in every respect and I do everything to prove to them that I am sane. One day an insane woman was brought in. She was noisy, and Miss Grady gave her a beating and blacked her eye. When the doctors noticed it and asked if it was done before she came there, the nurses said it was. While I was in Hall Six, I never heard the nurses address the patients except to scold them or yell at them, unless it was to tease them. They spent much of their time gossiping about the physicians and about the other nurses in a manner that was not elevating. Miss Grady nearly always interspersed her conversation with profane language, and generally began her sentences by calling on the name of the Lord. The names she called the patients were of the lowest and most profane type. One evening she quarreled with another nurse while we were at supper about the bread, 
and when the nurse had gone out she called her bad names and made ugly remarks about her. In the evenings a woman, whom I supposed to be head cook for the doctors, used to come up and bring raisins, grapes, apples, and crackers to the nurses. Imagine the feelings of the hungry patients as they sat and watched the nurses eat what was to them a dream of luxury. One afternoon, Dr. Dent was talking to a patient, Mrs. Turney, about some trouble she had had with a nurse or matron. A short time after, we were taken down to supper, and this woman who had beaten Mrs. Turney, and of whom Dr. Dent spoke, was sitting at the door of our dining room. Suddenly, Mrs. Turney picked up her bowl of tea, and rushing out of the door, flung it at the woman who had beat her. There was some loud screaming, and Mrs. Turney was returned to her place. The next day, she was transferred to the rope gang which is supposed to be composed of the most dangerous and most suicidal women on the island. At first I could not... I want to say that the night nurse, Burns, in Hall 6, seemed very kind and patient to the poor, afflicted people. The other nurses made several attempts to talk to me about lovers, and asked me if I would not like to have one. They did not find me very communicative on the, to them, popular subject. Once a week the patients are given a bath, and that is the only time they see soap. A patient handed me a piece of soap one day, about the size of a thimble. I considered it a great compliment in her wanting to be kind, but I thought she would appreciate the cheap soap more than I, so I thanked her but refused to take it. On bathing day the tub is filled with water, and the patients are washed, one after the other, without a change of water. This is done until the water is really thick, and then it is allowed to run out, and the tub is refilled without being washed. The same towels are used on all the women, those with eruptions as well as those without. The healthy patients fight for a change of water, but they are compelled to submit to the dictates of the lazy, tyrannical nurses. The dresses are seldom changed oftener than once a month. If a patient has a visitor, I have seen the nurses hurry her out and change her dress before the visitor comes in. This keeps up the appearance of careful and good management. The patients who are not able to take care of themselves get into beastly conditions, and the nurses never looked after them, but order some of the patients to do so. For five days we were compelled to sit in the room all day. I never put in such a long time. Every patient was stiff and sore and tired. We would get in little groups on benches and torture our stomachs by conjuring up thoughts of what we would eat first when we got out. If I had not known how hungry they were, and the pitiful side of it, the conversation would have been very amusing. As it was, it only made me sad. When the subject of eating, which seemed to be the favorite one, was worn out, they used to give their opinions of the institution and its management. The condemnation of the nurses and the eatables was unanimous. As the days passed, Miss Tilly Mayard's condition grew worse. She was continually cold and unable to eat of the food provided. Day after day she sang in order to try to maintain her memory, but at last the nurse made her stop it. I talked with her daily, and I grieved to find her grow worse so rapidly. At last she got a delusion. She thought that I was trying to pass myself off for her, and that all the people who called to see Nellie Brown were friends in search of her, but that I, by some means, was trying to deceive them into the belief that I was the girl. I tried to reason with her, but found it impossible, so I kept away from her as much as possible, lest my presence should make her worse and feed the fancy. One of the patients, Mrs. Cotter, a pretty, delicate woman, one day thought she saw her husband coming up the walk. She left the line in which she was marching and ran to meet him. For this act, she was sent to the retreat. She afterwards said, The remembrance of that is enough to make me mad. For crying, the nurses beat me with a broom handle and jumped on me, injuring me internally, so that I shall never get over it. Then they tied my hands and feet, and throwing a sheet over my head, twisted it tightly round my throat, so I could not scream, and thus put me in a bathtub filled with cold water. They held me under until I gave up every hope and became senseless. At other times they took hold of my ears and beat my head on the floor and against the wall. Then they pulled out my hair by the roots so that it will never grow in again. Mrs. Cotter here showed me proofs of her story, the dent in the back of her head and the bare spots where their hair had been taken out by the handful. 
I give her story as plainly as possible. My treatment was not as bad as I have seen others get in there, but it has ruined my health, and even if I do get out of here, I will be a wreck. When my husband heard of the treatment given me, he threatened to expose the place if I was not removed, so I was brought here. I am well mentally now. All that old fear has left me, and the doctor has promised to allow my husband to take me home. I made the acquaintance of Bridget McGinnis, who seems to be sane at the present time. She said she was sent to Retreat 4 and put on the rope gang. The beating I got there was something dreadful. I was pulled around by the hair, held under the water until I strangled, and I was choked and kicked. The nurses would always keep a quiet patient stationed at the window to tell them when any of the doctors were approaching. It was hopeless to complain to the doctors, for they always said it was the imagination of our diseased brains, and besides, we would get another beating for telling. They would hold patients under the water and threaten to leave them to die there if they did not promise not to tell the doctors. We would all promise, because we knew the doctors would not help us, and we would do anything to escape the punishment. After breaking a window, I was transferred to the lodge, the worst place on the island. It is dreadfully dirty in there, and the stench is awful. In the summer, the flies swarm the place. The food is worse than we get in other words, wards, and we are given only tin plates. Instead of the bars being on the outside, as in this ward, they are on the inside. There are many quiet patients there who have been there for years, but the nurses keep them to do the work. Among other beating I got there, the nurses jumped on me once and broke two of my ribs. While I was there, a pretty young girl was brought in. She had been sick, and she fought against being put in that dirty place. One night, the nurses took her, and after beating her, they held her naked in a cold bath. Then they threw her on the bed. When morning came, the girl was dead. The doctors said she died of convulsions, and that was all that was done about it. They inject so much morphine and chloral that the patients are made crazy. I have seen patients wild for water from the effect of the drugs, and the nurses would refuse it to them. I have heard women beg for a whole night for one drop, and it was not given them. I myself cried for water until my mouth was so parched and dry that I could not speak. I saw the same thing myself in Hall 7. The patients would beg for a drink before retiring, but the nurses... Miss Hart and the others, refused to unlock the bathroom that they might quench their thirst. Chapter 16. The Last Goodbye The day Pauline Moser was brought to the asylum, we heard the most horrible screams, and an Irish girl, only partly dressed, came staggering like a drunken person up the hall, yelling, Hurrah! Hurrah! Three cheers! I have killed the devil! "'Lucifer! Lucifer! Lucifer!' and so on, over and over again. Then she would pull a handful of hair out, while she exultingly cried, "'How I deceived the devils! They always said God made hell, but he didn't!' Pauline helped the girl to make the place hideous, by singing the most horrible songs. After the Irish girl had been there an hour or so, Dr. Dent came in, and as he walked down the hall, Miss Group whispered to the demented girl, here is the devil coming, so go for him. Surprised that she would give a madwoman such instructions, I fully expected to see the frenzied creature rush at the doctor. Luckily she did not, but continued to repeat her refrain of, Oh, Lucifer! After the doctor left, Miss Group again tried to excite the woman, by saying the pictured minstrel on the wall was the devil, and the poor creature began to scream, You devil! I'll give it to you! so that two nurses had to sit on her to keep her down. The attendants seemed to find amusement and pleasure in exciting the violent patients to do their worst. I always made a point of telling the doctors I was sane and asking to be released, but the more I endeavored to ensure them of my sanity, the more they doubted it. "'What are you doctors here for?' I asked one, whose name I cannot recall. "'To take care of patients and to test their sanity,' he replied. "'Very well.' I said. There are sixteen doctors on this island, and excepting two, I have never seen them pay any attention to the patients. How can a doctor judge a woman's sanity by merely bidding her a good morning and refusing to hear her pleas for release? 
Even the sick ones know it is useless to say anything, for the answer will be that it is their imagination. Try every test on me, I have urged others, and tell me, am I sane or insane? Try my pulse, my heart, my eyes. Ask me to stretch out my arm, to work my fingers, as Dr. Fields did at Bellevue, and then tell me if I am sane. They would not heed me, for they thought I raved. Again I said to one, You have no right to keep sane people here. I am sane, and have always been so, and I must insist on a thorough examination, or be released. Several of the women here are also sane. Why can't they be free? They are insane, was the reply, and suffering from delusions. After a long talk with Dr. Ingram, he said, I will transfer you to a quieter ward. An hour later, Miss Grady called me into the hall, and after calling me all the vile and profane names a woman could ever remember, she told me that it was a lucky thing for my hide that I was transferred, or else she would pay me for remembering so well to tell Dr. Ingram everything. You blanked hussy! You forget all about yourself, but you never forget anything to tell the doctor. After calling Miss Neville, whom Dr. Ingram also kindly transferred, Miss Grady took us to the hall above. Number seven. In Hall seven, there are Mrs. Croner, Miss Fitzpatrick, Miss Finney, and Miss Hart. I did not see as cruel treatment as downstairs, but I heard them make ugly remarks and threats, twist the fingers, and slap the faces of the unruly patients. The night nurse, Conway, I believe her name is, is very cross. In Hall seven, if any of the patients possessed any modesty, they soon lost it. Everyone was compelled to undress in the hall before their own door, and to fold their clothes and leave them there until morning. I asked to undress in my room, but Miss Conway told me if she ever caught me at such a trick, she would give me cause not to want to repeat it. The first doctor I saw here, Dr. Caldwell, chucked me under the chin, and as I was tired refusing to tell where my home was, I would only speak to him in Spanish. Hall 7 looks rather nice to a casual visitor. It is hung with cheap pictures and has a piano which is presided over by Miss Maddie Morgan, who formerly was in a music store in this city. She has been training several of the patients to sing, with some show of success. The artiste of the hall is under, pronounced Wanda, a Polish girl. She is a gifted pianist when she chooses to display her ability. The most difficult music she reads at a glance, and her touch and expression are perfect. On Sunday, the quieter patients, whose names have been handed in by the attendants during the week, are allowed to go to church. A small Catholic chapel is on the island, and other services are also held. A commissioner came one day, and made the rounds with Dr. Dent. In the basement they found half the nurses gone to dinner, leaving the other half in charge of us, as was always done. Immediately orders were given to bring the nurses back to their duties, until after the patients had finished eating. Some of the patients wanted to speak about their having no salt, but were prevented. The insane asylum on Blackwell's Island is a human rat trap. It is easy to get in, but once there it is impossible to get out. I had intended to have myself committed to the violent wards, the lodge and retreat, but when I got the testimony of two sane women and could give it, I decided not to risk my health and hair, so I did not get violent. I had, toward the last, been shut off from all visitors, and so when the lawyer— Peter A. Hendricks, came and told me that friends of mine were willing to take charge of me if I would rather be with them than in the asylum. I was only too glad to give my consent. I asked him to send me something to eat immediately on his arrival in the city, and then I waited anxiously for my release. It came sooner than I had hoped. I was out in line, taking a walk, and had just gotten interested in a poor woman who had fainted away while the nurses were trying to compel her to walk. "'Good-bye! I am going home!' I called to Pauline Moser, as she went past with a woman on either side of her. Sadly, I said farewell to all I knew as I passed them on my way to freedom and life, while they were left behind, to a fate worse than death. "'Adios!' I murmured to the Mexican woman. I kissed my fingers to her, and so I left my companions of Hall 7. I had looked forward so eagerly to leaving the horrible place— Yet when my release came, and I knew that God's sunlight was to be free for me again, there was a certain pain in leaving. For ten days I had been one of them. Foolishly enough, it seemed intensely selfish to leave them to their sufferings. 
I felt a quixotic desire to help them by sympathy and presence. But only for a moment. The bars were down, and freedom was sweeter to me than ever. Soon I was crossing the river and nearing New York. Once again I was a free girl after ten days in the madhouse on Blackwell's Island. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 The Grand Jury Investigation Soon after I had bidden farewell to Blackwell's Island Insane Asylum, I was summoned to appear before the grand jury. I answered the summons with pleasure, because I longed to help those of God's most unfortunate children, whom I had left prisoners behind me. If I could not bring them out of that boon of all boons, liberty, I hoped at least to influence others to make life more bearable for them. I found the jurors to be gentlemen, and that I need not tremble before their twenty-three august presences. I swore to the truth of my story, and then I related all, from my start at the temporary home until my release. Assistant District Attorney Vernon M. Davis conducted the examination. The jurors then requested that I should accompany them on a visit to the island. I was glad to consent. No one was expected to know of the contemplated trip to the island, yet we had not been there very long before one of the commissioners of charity and Dr. MacDonald of Ward's Island were with us. One of the jurors told me that in conversation with the man about the asylum, he heard that they were notified of our coming an hour before we reached the island. This must have been done while the grand jury were examining the insane pavilion at Bellevue. The trip to the island was vastly different to my first. This time we went on a clean new boat, while the one I had traveled in, they said, was laid up for repairs. Some of the nurses were examined by the jury and made contradictory statements to one another, as well as to my story. They confessed that the jury's contemplated visit had been talked over between them and the doctor. Dr. Dent confessed that he had no means by which to tell positively if the bath was cold, and of the number of women put into the same water. He knew the food was not what it should be, but said that it was due to lack of funds. If nurses were cruel to their patients, had he any positive means of ascertaining it? No, he had not. He said all the doctors were not competent, which was also due to the lack of means to secure a good medical men. In the conversation with me, he said, I am glad you did this now, and had I known your purpose, I would have aided you. We have no means of learning the way things are going, except to do as you did. Since your story was published, I found a nurse at the retreat, who had watches set for our approach, just as you stated. She was dismissed. Miss Anne Neville was brought down, and I went into the hall to meet her, knowing that the sight of so many strange gentlemen would excite her, even if she was sane. It was as I feared. The attendants had told her she was going to be examined by a crowd of men, and she was shaking with fear. Although I had left her only two weeks before, yet she looked as if she had suffered a severe illness in that time, so changed was her appearance. I asked her if she had taken any medicine, and she answered in the affirmative. I then told her that all I wanted her to do was tell the jury all we had done since I was brought with her to the asylum, so they would be convinced that I was sane. She only knew me as Miss Nellie Brown, and was wholly ignorant of my story. She was not sworn, but her story must have convinced all heroes of the truth of my statements. When Miss Brown and I were brought here, the nurses were cruel, and the food was too bad to eat. We did not have enough clothing, and Miss Brown asked for more all the time. I thought she was being very kind, for when a doctor promised her some clothing, she said she would give it to me. Strange to say, ever since Miss Brown has been taken away, everything is different. The nurses are very kind, and we are given plenty to wear. The doctors come to see us often, and the food is greatly improved. Did we need more evidence? The jurors then visited the kitchen. It was very clean, and two barrels of salt stood conspicuously open near the door. The bread on exhibition was beautifully white, and wholly unlike what was given us to eat. We found the halls in the finest order. The beds were improved, and in Hall 7 the buckets in which we were compelled to wash had been replaced by bright new basins. The institution was on exhibition, and no fault could be found. But the women I had spoken of, where were they? Not one was to be found where I had left them. If my assertions were not true in regard to these patients, why should the latter be changed, so to make me unable to find them? Miss Neville complained before the jury of being changed several times. 
When we visited the hall later, she was returned to her old place. Mary Hughes, of whom I had spoken as appearing sane, was not to be found. Some relatives had taken her away. Where, they knew not. The fair woman I had spoken of, who had been sent here because she was poor, they said had been transferred to another island. They denied all knowledge of the Mexican woman, and said there never had been such a patient. Mrs. Cotter had been discharged, and Bridget McGinnis and Rebecca Farron had been transferred to other quarters. The German girl, Margaret, was not to be found, and Louise had been sent elsewhere from Hall 6. The French woman, Josephine, a great healthy woman, they said was dying of paralysis, and we could not see her. If I was wrong in my judgment of these patients' sanity, why was all this done? I saw Tilly Mayard, and she had changed so much for the worse that I shuddered when I looked at her. I hardly expected the grand jury to sustain me, after they saw everything different from what it had been while I was there. Yet they did, and their report to the court advises all the changes made that I had proposed. I have one consolation for my work. On the strength of my story, the Committee of Appropriation provides one million dollars more than was ever given before for the benefit of the insane. End of chapter 17 End of Ten Days in a Madhouse